has been on Jesus' lane. Silent as he stood accused, beaten not in scorn, bowing to the Father's will, he turned. Who 
shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace Free, 
and my shame is under your presence Speaking to us again this morning. 
if you didn't tune in two weeks ago to hear his first message, it's well worth watching. I especially liked it when he talked about people being jealous of our faith, of our relationship with God, of others wanting what we've got. How are you going at making people jealous of your faith? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are here right now, no matter where we might be. As we share together in worship, communion, and hearing from your word, we want you to be glorified. Have your way in our lives. Draw us closer to you and closer to each other. We pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amazing. 
amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set I see you for all that you've done for me.
On Saturday nights, it's movie night in our household. And recently we watched a movie called Overcomer uh, by the Kendrick Brothers. I believe it's made in uh, 2019. Uh, there's, the movie follows the story of some um, challenging life circumstances of some people. Uh, two of which being uh, John Harrison, a basketball coach at the local uh, Christian high school, and the other being a 15-year-old girl who has been trying to navigate through life uh, on her own somewhat since the loss of her parents and um, being raised uh, by only her grandmother. Uh, now, here's a spoiler alert. Um, there's a key point in the movie where uh, the basketball coach gets asked this question. If I asked you who you are, what would the first thing you would say? If I asked you who you are, what's the first thing you would say? It's, it was quite a provoking question and it catches John uh, off guard. Uh, but then he proceeds to answer and says that he's a basketball coach. And he gets then asked this question, if that was taken away from you, who would you say you are? It's very interesting um, uh, as we think about this question. And um, as you're watching and tuning in right now to this, I want to ask you that question. Who is dot dot dot? Who is, um, if I asked you who you are, what would the first thing uh, you would say? Um, well, Psalm 139 in God's Word tells me that before I was a pharmacist, before I was a husband and a father, uh, before I was a Vietnamese-born Australian larrikin with an impeccable sense of humour and unfortunate levels of cholesterol, I was and I am a precious creation of Christ. Um, that I am not a mistake, but I have been fearfully and wonderfully made. That I am um, a co heir in Christ and that I um, have been purposed for God's glory. You are too. You are also a precious creation of Christ. Let that be a um, reminder to you today. Um, do not let yourself be defined by um, your current circumstances, but be reminded that you are God's handiwork, uh, created in Christ Jesus and um, purposeful uh, God, for good works um, that have been prepared by God in advance. Um, if you have been baptised in Jesus Christ, all you want to be, uh, God's word promises that we uh, are co heir in Christ. And that means that we um, share in God's suffering, but we also share in God's glory. What an amazing um, promise that is made to us uh, that defines who we are, our true identity. So um, right now, as we share in um, the Lord's Supper, as we share in the bread that symbolizes his, his body, uh, as we share in the wine um, that is, or the juice that symbolizes his blood, may we be reminded of um, Jesus' body that was broken up for us. And may we be reminded of God, uh, of Jesus' blood that was poured out for us.
this morning as we um, share in um, the Lord's Supper, may we be reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus paid for us so that we may be restored to our true identity that cannot be taken away once we have um, chosen to freely accept uh, accept it in faith. What was given to us um, and what was given to us freely in love. So as you are reminded by who you are in Christ, I pray that uh, this morning, um, that uh, regardless of the um, health circumstances that feels like it's defining you, or that strained relationship that uh, might be um, consuming who you are and um, clouding your vision of seeing who you are in Christ. May that fog be lifted from your eyes and may um, you be able to hit that reset button and see how you are um, a precious creation in Christ. I pray um, that yeah you will um, approach this week with a refreshed view on who Christ is and what he has done for you and who you are in Christ. And may you be able to persevere through your current circumstances with the strength that God has given you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. That, our, that who we are, that our identity is rooted in who you are. I thank you, Lord, um, for the sacrifice that you have made, that we may be restored to our true identity in you. We give you thanks. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi everyone, I'm here on behalf of the Elders. Recently we informed you that we had appointed a new ministry team leader here at Monash City Church of Christ. Well today it's my privilege to be able to introduce to you Conrad Parsons. Hi. Welcome Conrad, it's great to have you here. Thank you. As we're still not meeting together in person um, as a full congregation, Conrad's agreed to sit down with me and answer a few questions so that you can get to know him a little bit better. First of all, Conrad, there's a couple of titles that are floating around. <laughs> You're a reverend yeah. and a doctor. A few people have said, what should we call him? Yeah, and I used to be a captain. So, you know, Reverend Dr. Cameron would be fine, but captain. Um, look, just call me Conrad. Uh, you're obviously going to need a handle to describe me to other people. So just say, oh, he's the minister. But when you're talking to me, please just call me Conrad. Fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your family situation, Conrad? Yes, yeah, so married for 29 years. Um, my wife's about 20, and we have three teenage children, and uh, 18, 16, and 14. Two of them are still in high school. And um, uh, we moved to Melbourne 2009, so I don't know how long it is, 11 years. Uh, and before that we were in Sydney and Wendy and I have lived in Brisbane and also in London. So we've moved around a little bit, um, but our children were born in Sydney and then we came down here to work with Youth for Christ. Fantastic. What do you like to do in your free time? Uh, beat my wife at tennis, which is pretty tough. Um, walking, uh, watching movies and flying around the world. Mm, fantastic. Yeah, which I haven't been able to do for a very long time. Not this year at least. No. 
how did you come to be a Christian and then get involved in ministry? Uh, well, I heard the stories about Jesus when I was a child through some brief visits to a Sunday school in Adelaide. So a lady called Miss Dutton told me the stories of Jesus. Then in year seven, my scripture teacher, who was a local minister, convinced me on the historical reliability of the Bible. Um, and then when I was a teenager, I went along to a Christian youth group. And my friends and I started kind of working out what this was all about and what, what is a Christian and how does a Christian live. And, uh, but then when I was uh, about 17, 18, probably about 18 or 19, I met a fellow called Bruce and I noticed the difference between him and the people in my church. And it, like I could see in him that Christianity actually works and that he knew God personally and um, there was something about him that I thought was really good. And, um, uh, and he was he was trained by an organisation called Church Army, hence the title of captain. And um, so uh, I decided that if God was real, then I would go and tell other people about God. So I applied to go into college and then I panicked because I thought they won't accept me. And then they did accept me and I got cold feet. And then I was counting the cost and I read a sermon by John Wesley. And as a result of reading that sermon, I surrendered my life to the Lord. And I went into college two weeks later. Yeah, terrific. What roles have you been recently involved in prior to coming here? Okay, so recently, I guess you could say um, National Director of Youth for Christ Australia, then Regional Director for Youth for Christ Pacific. Um, so going into Nauru and Kiribati and those sort of countries. Um, and then uh, Youth Ministry Consultant for Melbourne Anglican Diocese, so coaching, supporting youth workers, youth ministers. And then I was Melanesian Wontok, which I got to choose the name myself. No one understands it, but it, essentially Wontok is a trusted friend or relative. And Melanesia is Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands. And so I have a love for those people. And so my role was a liaison between Australia and those countries. But COVID put an end to that. And so I became unemployed for a period. What are you most looking forward to about your, um, this new role here at Monash? Mm. Okay, so I love people. And what I'm most looking forward to is an opportunity to teach, but more than that, to see people grow spiritually and to, um, uh, to experience and to enjoy all that God has for them. So I think my role is to help create the atmosphere in the body where that's going to be happening increasingly and people are able to you know, hear the gospel and then uh, pass that life on to others. Yeah, good. That's what I'm looking forward to. Good. You're going to start preaching to us from next week on what's the 6th of December. Yes. What can we expect to hear from you? Fire and brimstone. Uh, no. Uh, it will be encouraging, hopefully inspiring. Uh, it will be about Jesus. I'm going to focus on John's gospel because that's what I've been reading myself lately and it's been coming alive to me in a, in a really good way. So that's the best place to preach from. This is what God's been feeding me with. So I want everyone, the whole church, to read John chapters 8 to 15 by next Sunday. Yep, can do. Looking yeah? forward to it. Oh, good. Okay, but uh, yeah, I'll be working through those chapters of John. Okay, fantastic. To finish off, I want to play a quick round of either or. So you're going to have two <laughs> options, and you can only choose one. Uh, Make sense? Okay. You feel free to add a little bit more if you need to justify yourself. Mm. They should be pretty straight. Okay. First one, tea or coffee? Coffee. Coffee. Okay. You're originally from New South Wales. Mm. Is it AFL or rugby league? <laughs> AFL. Good. Good answer. <laughs> Classical or pop music? Pop. The Masked Singer or The Block? Masked Singer. Okay. John Piper or Ravi Zacharias? Ravi Zacharias. Okay. Camping or a four-star hotel? Notice I've said four-star. You're on a minister's <laughs> salary, so I'm not going to find just a four-star hotel. Oh, you know what? My family would go camping and I would do it because they love it, but if it was just me, it would be four-star hotel. Okay. This is a multicultural church. Mm. Sausage rolls or dumplings? Oh boy. You know what? I 
probably, I probably would go the dumplings just because I don't like sausage rolls. Okay, easy. Hillsong or Elevation Worship? Probably Hillsong. Okay. My wife's influence. Okay. Apple or Samsung? <laughs> Apple. Okay. Final one. Yeah. Old Testament or New? Stop there. Uh, right? <laughs> that was a trick question. Yeah. Thank you for joining me, Conrad, just for this right. short conversation. Thanks, Dave. We want to say that we're really looking forward to having you here at Monash and for you to lead us and that we are yeah, looking forward to hearing what you teach and how, how God works through you um, in this place and in our community. Um, we will do a formal induction service for Conrad uh, once we can meet together in person as a full congregation. But in the meantime, please pray for Conrad and continue to pray for the leaders of the church. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom and blessings to you and hope that you're all well at Monash City Church. Thank you for the opportunity to return today to share with you once again on bringing the message to the original messengers, that is to bring the gospel to Jewish people from whence the gospel came from in the first place. This, of course, is the vision and mission of Celebrate Messiah is to share the gospel with Jewish people. And we are here in Melbourne, reaching out to Jewish people in the Holy Land. Where's the Holy Land of Australia? Well, right here in Caulfield. In this environment here and surrounding suburbs of Caulfield, uh, we have around 75,000 Jewish people and about 45 synagogues. And the Lord has uh, called us to be a testimony and to reach out to Jewish people right in this part of the uh, Caulfield area. And so Celebrate Messiah has been established for 25 years, and uh, we're really praising God for all that he uh, is doing in and through us and in reaching Jewish people who, to tell you the truth, are becoming more and more open to the good news of the Messiah in, in these days. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you. May the Lord bless you all. And I hope that last week's message uh, was helpful to you and that uh, today we can continue to talk about this subject. Let me uh, share the screen with you. Okay, bring in the message to the original messengers. Here we are. All right, so uh, I'd like to continue on the subject. Really, today will be a lot more practical than last week. Last week, we talked about some very important principles on bringing the gospel to Jewish people, principles that were gleaned uh, primarily from the book of Romans in the Apostle Paul's writings, principles that really would stand us in very good stead as we want to share the message of the Messiah with Jewish people. Uh, I didn't share a lot of details on how to share the gospel or practical tips. That is what I'm going to do today. Last week was more about uh, broader principles in bringing the gospel to Jewish people. So uh, just to let you know a little bit more about Celebrate Messiah as we begin, uh, we are 25 years old as a mission to Jewish people here in Australia. We started here in Australia, but uh, today we have work uh, across the world, which is um, an incredible encouragement and blessing to us. Our primary uh, ways in which we share the gospel with Jewish people is uh, through creative evangelism, trying to share the gospel in, in whatever creative way we can find, whether it's online, which has really been uh, a lot of our work recently, of course, under the COVID-19 restrictions and lockdown, just about all our evangelism and services and seminars have gone online. And you can have a look up at Celebrate Messiah uh, at our Facebook page or Celebrate Messiah on YouTube or our website and find uh, a lot of our teaching seminars and even some of our evangelistic uh, literature and uh, sermons and seminars as well. Our other uh, main area of ministry is planting communities and our hope and our desire is to plant worshipping communities of Yeshua following disciples of uh, Jesus. And um, 
We have plant what we call messianic corrugations. These are corrugations that work with, worship Jesus in a way that's culturally sensitive and relevant to Jewish people. And in Melbourne, we've planted Beit HaMashiach, House of the Messiah, and uh, it's a sister Church of Christ congregation planted in the heart of uh, Caulfield, the old Bamber Road Church of Christ that has now become the Caulfield Messianic Center, a brand new center that we're only just moving into. And also uh, the other way, of course, that we like to reach out is just by doing good in the name of Yeshua through a whole variety of benevolent type ministries. Uh, look on the website at setabatmessiah.com.au for more information about our ministry and also teaching about Israel, the Jewish people, prophecy, evangelism, etc. Also, if you want to have a look at uh, some testimonies at ourfoundshalom.com, uh, you'd see a testimony that I've given on that uh, website. It's our ministry website uh, together with our partner ministry, Chosen People Ministry, but also um, uh, dozens of other Jewish people share their testimonies on the site. You'll find it very interesting and hopefully encouraging. Uh, now, let me begin uh, today by uh, sharing with you a little bit more about Jewish people. Today, we're going to look at uh, more practical tips and uh, encouragements on how you can reach out to your Jewish friend with the message of the Messiah. But uh, first of all, uh, we need to understand the Jewish people and understand uh, the diversity within Judaism and also uh, how uh, you know, Jewish people come from a variety of different backgrounds and, of course, also um, uh, different cultures in a sense. Uh, in Melbourne alone, we have uh, Jews, of course, from Israel. We have Jews from Eastern Europe. We have Jews from Russia and even from the Central Asian Republics. And uh, we might all be Jewish, but we all have slightly different nuances of culture and uh, tradition. Uh, this is a video that uh, we first produced uh, for our ministry uh, about 23 years ago, uh, but it really does uh, reflect uh, some of the diversity within the Jewish culture. So let me share with you uh, this, this video. Australia has become home for many Jewish people building a community proud of their heritage and identity. Many of the Jewish people living in Australia strive to preserve their rich culture, religious observances, and unique character. This culture and religion allows for a wide spectrum of beliefs and views. This diversity extends to the Jewish opinion on the question of Jesus Christ. We asked Jewish people on the streets, who do you think Jesus is? Jesus is the Messiah for the Christians. But uh, for the Jews, he was just one of the great teachers of the Jewish people. I have no idea we're Jewish. So not interested. You about who he is? No, not interested. Who do I think he was? He was a man from the Galil, from the Galilee. And he was uh, what we call a Talmud Chatham. Uh, he was a, a smart student, but he rebelled against his rabbi. And so, and then he went off in his ways. And what can you do? A lot of blood has been shed because of him. The Jewish people living in Australia represent a large unreached people group. A people that need to hear the message they were once called to bear. For these people to hear and accept the message of the gospel, it needs to be communicated within their cultural boundaries. Very interesting, isn't it? As you... Uh have a look at uh, the opinions that uh, Jewish people have about Jesus. Uh, you really do get a variety of answers. And uh, on the streets of uh, Melbourne, that's uh, a question that we put to Jewish people uh, some years ago. Who do you think Jesus is? So uh, the actual answers um, really give us a bit of a, a spectrum of uh, some of the thoughts. And uh, it's really helpful to have a look at that. So the one uh, Jewish person said, Jesus is the Christ for the Christians, but not the Messiah for the Jews. We're the Christ for the Christians, but not the Messiah for the Jews. This is an interesting opinion, which um, really uh, is held by many Jewish people. And that is that, uh, well, you know, it's a polite answer. Jesus is really for Gentiles, but he's not for us Jewish people. 
It's trying to acknowledge that he is um, a great leader of a religion, but that religion is not for the Jewish people. And of course, uh, you might come across this kind of uh, uh, answer to the question that if you ask your Jewish friend, who do you think Jesus is? Jesus is, this is what they may say. Well, he, he, he's great for you Gentiles, but he's not good for us Jewish people. Now, just one of the ways in which I would respond to an answer like that or an objection like this would be to say, well, Jesus did not see himself as the Messiah for the Gentiles primarily or at first anyway. He clearly showed himself and declared himself to be the Messiah of the Jews. In fact, he had even said to people, uh, I, I've not come to call um, the Gentiles, but to call the lost sheep of the house of Israel um, to be saved. Uh, and so, you know, it's very clear from the scriptures that Jesus claims to be the promised Messiah of Israel and of the Jewish people. And if Jesus is not the Messiah for Jews, he really can't be the Messiah for anyone. And that's a very important point. Either Jesus is the Messiah for Jews and for the whole world, or really he shouldn't be anyone's Messiah, because certainly I don't want to follow a false Messiah uh, or a partial Messiah. Either he is or he isn't. There's no kind of light uh, middle ground. Either Jesus is Messiah for Jews and for the whole world, or he's nobody's Messiah. Then, of course, uh, you had another polite answer by this one Jewish man who said, Jesus is a good teacher. Jesus was a good rabbi. Jesus was a good rabbi, but not the Messiah for Jews. Again, this is a polite answer, uh, and it's true. Jesus was a good rabbi. He certainly was a rabbi. He certainly had people who followed him, and he taught in a, in a very Jewish a rabbinic way, uh, although it certainly he was different to the other rabbis, teaching with authority, but he was a good teacher. But he was more than just a good teacher, wasn't he? And if he is a good teacher, surely a good teacher will tell us the truth and not lie to us. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Is that true or is that a lie? Well, if he's a good teacher, he'll tell us the truth. Therefore, that must be true as well. Uh, of course, uh, this follows the kind of logic that is often uh, helpful in evangelism. Uh, C.S. Lewis spoke about this, about either Jesus is Lord, lunatic, or liar. Lord, lunatic, or liar. We have to make up our choice, make up our mind. Can't be, um, you can't be Lord and liar at the same time. One Jewish person said, I don't know, and I don't care. Well, that's a very honest answer and pro probably reflects uh, the majority of Jewish people. I don't know, and I don't care to know. Um, and so this is the, the role that we play as believers. Uh, and, and certainly, as I explained last week, the role of Gentiles who have come to faith in Jesus to provoke Jewish people to jealousy. Perhaps if that person saw what a Christian really looks like and what kind of person... Um, and what kind of faith that person will have, well, then that might provoke them to je jealousy, that they may be uh, called, uh, you know, led to, to consider who Jesus truly is. The one Orthodox Jewish young man said on the street, he said, Jesus was a rebellious rabbi. Um, he was a rabbi, but he went off in his ways, he said. Well, that's an interesting one. And actually, uh, there is uh, some... Uh, verses in the Talmud, the rabbinic writings about this, that Jesus was a rabbi, but then he, uh, he was rebellious against uh, his, uh, his authority and went off on a, on a different tangent. And so that's what's taught to, uh, taught to ultra-Orthodox Jewish people and connected with the, this uh, last one that he, um, he led people astray, his deceiver, again, this is spoken about in the, the, uh, the Talmud that Jesus led people astray and did miracles um, by the power of uh, uh, Satan, really, or evil, and, um, and that we shouldn't follow him. So these are popular opinions. Um, you know, secular Jews will have different answer to the question, who is Jesus, than an Orthodox Jew. 
uh, and some would be very polite and some would be quite blunt. But that was certainly interesting, wasn't it? And what people on the street think about Jesus. It's a good question to ask, by the way. And in our training in evangelism, uh, we, we say that it's one of the best questions you can ask somebody, whether they're Jewish or not, doesn't matter. But ask the question, who do you think Jesus is? It was the question that Jesus put to his disciples. Uh, remember at Caesarea Philippi, he said, who do the people say that I am? It's a very good starting point in a conversation about faith. Ask them, who do you think Jesus is? And then when they answer that question, you know immediately where they're at. And you can then uh, find ways in which to continue that conversation and bring that person closer to the gospel message. So let's uh, move on a little bit and uh, try further understand Jewish people. This is a, a hard task. I don't think we even understand ourselves. We're pretty complex, but certainly uh, we can understand a little bit more about Jewish faith and religion and uh, Jewish worldview. So uh, let me say that most Jewish people um, are secular and they value tradition and cultural elements of their faith more than the religious. Now, that's the majority of Jewish people. Um, primarily, we, we are secular. That's a good 80% uh, of us um, really uh, have a, an attachment to our traditions and our culture, but aren't fully observant of Jewish tradition. And, of course, those who are observant are normally much more visible to the naked eye, so to speak, uh, by the clothes that they wear and um, by their traditions that they follow and observances. But, you know, uh, often people say to me, well, I don't know anyone Jewish and I've never met a Jewish person. Mostly it's because they didn't know that the person they meet at work or a colleague or a fellow student uh, are Jewish unless they've really asked the, the question. And so um, that's something important. Most modern Jews value tradition and cultural ele elements and not so much their, heritage, uh, their religion. They may value their heritage and enjoy Jewish cultural practices and enjoy Jewish festivals, but it's more for cultural and heritage reasons rather than a personal faith in God. Jewish people reject certain essential Christian teachings like the Trinity, the deity of Messiah, and the second coming. So, you know, um, it's just... Again, something that we've been brought up is to reject faith in Jesus and uh, particularly uh, some theological issues like the Trinity. It's very difficult for Jewish people to believe in the Trinity when the central confession of the Jewish faith is the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So Jewish people say, well, the Lord is one. God is one. He's not three. We can't believe in the Trinity and to believe in the Trinity is uh, idolatry. So, you know, we don't believe in three gods. Jewish people say we believe in one God. Well, that's, of course, uh, one of these issues, uh, uh, objections, theological objections to faith in Jesus that we need to overcome. And uh, I'm not going to be able to go into great detail today on all these things. But, of course, it's true that as Christians or believers in Jesus, we don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God very firmly. Uh, Jesus even said the most important commandment is Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He said it was the most important commandment. And so we believe in the unity of God, the oneness of God, but we do believe that God revealed himself in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God revealed in three persons, not three separate gods. And so uh, it's uh, often a misconception that Christians believe in three gods. And by the way, Muslims think of that, think of us that way as well. Uh, the deity of the Messiah is a, an issue that Jewish people can't accept. They may they say, well, the Messiah was going to be a man, a great man, but not God. Well, again, well, that's not what the Bible teaches us. Uh, the Bible does speak about the Messiah coming to earth as, uh, as man and God coming as man uh, in the name of Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, or, you know, a lot of other scriptures that we can talk about. But uh, we, we certainly do believe in the deity of Messiah, that Jewish people generally reject that as idolatry. And then, of course, the second coming. Uh, 
As believers in Jesus, we believe the Messiah is coming back. Jewish people are waiting for the Messiah's first coming. And uh, they believe that he'll do certain things at his first coming. One, for instance, is bring peace to the whole world. And then Jewish people say, well, how could Jesus be the Messiah? He didn't bring peace to the world. In fact, since he's come, there's more wars fought in his name. How could he be the Messiah? Well, we believe that the Messiah came the first time. As believers in Jesus, he came the first time to deal with the issue of sin in our lives. And the Messiah will return. He will come again. And when he comes, he will bring peace. And that's uh, something that uh, we're looking forward to in the future. He will fulfill those prophecies, but uh, he hasn't fulfilled that just yet. He's brought peace to our hearts, but when he returns, he'll bring peace to the whole world. So we're looking forward to the second coming. So uh, these are just some uh, important things that we, uh, we can see in differences between Judaism and Christianity. And also, we need to understand it's very hard for Jewish people to believe in Jesus. It's not just a personal decision. It's not just a personal decision. It's a decision that affects your family and a decision that affects your community. Because uh, there is always the threat of excommunication. If you're Jewish and believe in Jesus, there's very good likelihood that you're going to be chucked out of the Jewish community, that even your own family would reject you. And certainly, that is... Uh, the case in Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox families, if a believer, if one of the family members become a believer, they are sometimes totally excommunicated out of the family and taken for dead. Even a funeral service uh, will be conducted for that person, considering that person dead to the family and dead to Judaism, especially if the believer has become a baptized follower of Jesus. So there is a real threat of losing a community when you follow Jesus as Messiah, when you're Jewish. And so you can imagine that they'll hold back many people from taking that step of faith because the community may mean more, more to them than the truth. And that's a difficult thing uh, to overcome. Uh, you have to come to a point like I did where God's opinion became more important to me than man's opinion and that I had to follow the truth no matter what the costs. But not everyone is willing to take that step, and we should be very gentle and very understanding of someone in that position. Furthermore, uh, we can look at some other objections that Jewish people have. Um, and of course, a Jewish person, as I said, many of them are secular and could be, for instance, agnostic. That is, they, they generally believe in God, but not very specific uh, or personal faith in God. Um, um, well, that God is there, but you can't really know him, for instance. Uh, some Jews might be atheists, and certainly it may, it may be true of many Jews who have gone through suffering and deep suffering like the Holocaust. Very hard to hold on to your faith in God when you've seen the horrors of the Holocaust. And many Holocaust survivors uh, are atheists, as I'll show you in a video in a moment. And, um, and a lot of Jewish people don't really believe in the Bible. They believe that it's, uh, it's a good uh, anthology of, uh, of, 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 of teachings and writings and stories of the Jewish people, but they don't believe in it as the word of God. Of course, that's most likely the secular Jews or liberal Jews, but if you're Orthodox, you would believe in the word of God um, as the true word of God, but particularly you believe in the Torah, the first five books of Moses, as well as in the writings and the prophets, but put a greater emphasis on the Torah. Uh, and every Jewish person might be different. So don't assume because they're Jewish, they believe in the Bible. That uh, would be a mistake. And even though we might be called the people of the book, that's not necessarily true anymore, I'm afraid. The Bible is often an unread book by Jewish people. We might know the stories. Uh, we might know... The Talmud, even if you're an educated Jew, you'll know the Talmud, which is the rabbinic writings, but may not know the Bible itself. So bear that in mind when speaking to Jewish people. Okay. Uh, one of the major objections that Jewish people have is, uh, uh, is the issue of Christian anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. From a Jewish perspective, the Holocaust was perpetrated by Christians. Hitler, the German people were Christian people, whether Catholic or Protestant, 
Uh, they were Christians. It was a Christian nation. In fact, a very sophisticated and uh, well-developed Christian nation. And yet the Holocaust or the murder of six million Jews came out of what Judaism or, or Jewish people would see would be Christianity. Of course, we realize as believers in Jesus that the Holocaust was not perpetrated by Christians, but it was an evil perpetrated on a, uh, on a people um, because of hate and uh, murder and uh, racism and misconceptions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they were not true Christians who perpetrated the Holocaust. How could they be? How could a follower of Jesus kill anybody uh, and, uh, and hate anybody in actual fact? It's against the teachings of Jesus. So there's a lot of um, uh, myth to undo, but certainly uh, from an outside perspective or from a Jewish perspective, the Holocaust was perpetrated by Christians. So you can imagine it's a massive obstacle to overcome and might be one of the very first objections that a Jewish person might have to follow in Jesus or to even consider in Jesus as Messiah. How could I believe in Jesus when, the Christ when Christians uh, killed six million Jewish people? And so, of course, we have to have a polemic and answer uh, to that objection. Okay, let me show you a video of uh, a dear Holocaust survivor, how she expresses um, her, her pain of what she had seen. The war started and we had to go into the ghetto. I tried desperately to reach God. But he let me down, so I stopped believing. I stopped believing. So, who do you actually think Jesus is? I don't know. I don't even want to know. I don't know. As I said, it's very difficult when people have been through such great suffering to believe in God generally. And if you can't believe in God, why would you want to believe in Jesus? So it's, a, it's certainly an obstacle that we need to overcome and we have to be very careful not to have glib and um, uh, cliched answers to people who have gone through such great suffering as the Holocaust. And true for anyone who's gone through great suffering, who struggles with the idea of faith and belief, we need to be very, uh, very patient and very understanding of where they are coming from. And uh, love over a long period of time is what's needed to help people overcome great tragedy in their lives and consider faith in the Messiah. So let me continue. Let me give you some very practical tips in sharing the gospel with Jewish people. These are very practical evangelistic tips. These would be uh, some uh, witnessing tips or practical tips that you could use for evangelism to anyone. First and foremost, if you want to share the gospel with someone, be a friend. Be a real friend. Don't pretend to be a friend. Don't uh, present yourself as a friend, but your friendship then uh, is either um, you know, hot or cold, depending on their response to the gospel. Be a true friend. That's really perhaps the, the best way in which to, to be a witness to Jewish people in particular. And uh, you need to be sincere, friend. Otherwise, they'll smell a rat. Let me tell you, that will happen very quickly. Truly develop a loving relationship with uh, a Jewish person that you want to uh, witness to. Uh, this is not always possible to develop a relationship. You might have once-off encounters when you meet Jewish people uh, on a holiday or at, uh, at the shopping center or on a cruise or whatever it might be. And you may not be able to develop a relationship. And, and still share the gospel with them, but if you can and have the opportunity, be a true friend. Next tip is be a credible witness. So important us to remember that um, uh, that we are part of the message. That uh, the message we share has to be demonstrated in the lives that we live. Uh, we have to be a credible witness. Uh, people need to be able to see Messiah in us, the hope of glory. And so the way that we live our lives and the things that we do are great reflection on our faith in the Messiah. The, the book of James is full of this kind of advice, of course, that faith without works is dead. 
And then in order to demonstrate our faith, we need to have good works. Our lives need to reflect the, uh, the faith that we believe in. And that's so important uh, in Jewish evangelism. Be a credible witness. And, um, and the, message, the messenger is part of the message. We want to present Yeshua the Messiah. Uh, we need to, to be a credible witness and disciple of his. Uh, also, watch your language. I'm not talking about uh, just swear words, for instance, but I'm talking about terminology. Watch your language. Often the language we use as uh, believers is a very insider language that other people don't understand. Like, for, you know, typically, you know, if you might say to someone, I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. Well, you know, that might be a good song about that, but most people out there do not understand what that means. And it doesn't make any sense. You can't be washed in blood because if you're washed in blood, you'll be covered in blood. You're not whiter than snow. You're, you're, you're red as crimson. So, you know, uh, use a terminology that people understand. Don't use Christianese. Use terminology that, um, that is self-explanatory. Watch your language. And I think also uh, when, it, when you're talking about watching your language, we should also be uh, very careful on using uh, terminology that evokes emotion within Jewish people. And uh, so, for instance, uh, if you use the term Christ, I know that'd be very difficult for a Christian not to talk about Jesus Christ. But if you can remember, rather speak about Jesus, the Messiah. The term Christ evokes memories of the cross-bearing crusaders uh, who, in the name of Christ, killed Jewish people. Uh, Christ, the, the word Christ also evokes the pogroms of Eastern Europe where Jews were persecuted, murdered, and, um, and of course, um, uh, Shops were broken into. There was great persecution in the name of Christ. Also, the term Christ evokes the accusation that we Jews are Christ killers, that we killed Christ, we killed God. And a lot of pogroms and anti-Semitism has been um, developed on the, on the base of that accusation. So the term Christ, we don't understand. And if you can use the term Messiah, we certainly do understand that. So also present a person. Now, when presenting uh, and talking about faith, don't try and sell Christianity. Don't try and sell a religion. Sell a relationship, if you like. Talk about the person of Jesus and not the religion that surrounds him. Talk about the person. And let me tell you that people, others that you're trying to share the gospel with, they would want to talk about religion and they will use religion as a reason not to believe. They will say things like, well, I don't want to believe in Jesus because look at what religion has done to the world. All the wars fought in the name of Jesus and et cetera, et cetera. You can cut to the chase and say, well, I don't uh, want to talk about religion. I want to talk about the person of Jesus. Remember what I said? Ask them, who do you think Jesus is? Talk about the person of Jesus. That's the best practical advice I can give. Offer your priestly ministry. What do I mean about this? Well, your priestly ministry is your ministry of prayer. Jewish people crave prayer. They would love you to pray for them. And uh, this is something that's often quite unique to Jewish people who are not used to praying spontaneous prayers, but are used to praying prayers that are written in, in the Bible. Uh, that's not to say Judaism doesn't encourage spontaneous prayers, but most people don't, uh, don't exercise that. So you can, ex you can exercise your priestly ministry and pray. If you're speaking to a Jewish person, they share with you something that is a need, something that is a concern, pray for them. Tell them you'll pray for them. Or if you're bold enough, pray then and there. And yes, pray in the name of Yeshua, if you can, or in the name of Jesus. I'd be bold enough to do that. Uh, but personal prayer goes a long way. And you just pray God's blessing upon them. That'll go a long way to soften their hearts. Very seldom is your priestly ministry uh, rejected. Your prophetic ministry or proclamation might be, but not your priestly ministry. Then share your testimony. Most Jewish people think that if you're a Christian, you're born a Christian, you're born into the Christian home, you're baptized as a baby, and you had no choice, you are a Christian because that's the family that you're born into. Because that is true in Judaism. You're born into a Jewish family, you're circumcised at eight days old if you're a boy, and uh, you're, you're born a Jew. But 
we know the truth. You're not born a Christian, are we? You have to be born again. You have to come to faith and say yes to Jesus personally. Share with your Jewish friend your personal testimony of God coming into your life, changing you through your faith in Jesus and uh, provoke them to jealousy that way. Then affirm Jewish identity. Very important. Witness into Jewish people. Let them know they don't have to stop being Jewish to follow Jesus. Tell them you know of other Jews who follow Jesus, that there is a movement of Jews who follow Jesus in Australia and around the world, that we're Jewish and we're still following uh, the, uh, the Messiah and still keeping our Jewish identity and, uh, and our observances and practices. And, of course, um, that'll go a long way to leaving some of the concerns that a Jewish person might have, that if they follow Jesus, they're going to lose their Jewish identity. Some more practical, practical tips. Ask questions. You know that questions are so important. Just ask questions. Don't tell people the answers all the time. Provoke uh, them by asking questions. What do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? You can say something like, as a Jewish person, how do you practice your religion? What does it mean to you? How do you, do you keep the Sabbath? What do, what do you do to keep the Sabbath? What, you know, do you follow these different um, uh, festivals? And even better still, anticipate the next Jewish festival. And you can find out about a Jewish calendar on our website, for instance. Find out what the next, the next Jewish holiday is. And you can say to your Jewish friend, I believe coming up in December on the 9th of December is the festival of Hanukkah. What do you uh, know about the festival of Hanukkah and do you celebrate it? Ask questions. If you ask questions, you'll always get a chance to say something about your faith, but it's much more less confronting way to engage in a conversation. You can say questions like, how often do you read the Bible? What, re what role does it play in your life? What do you believe about the Messiah? What Jewish holiday is coming up soon and what does it mean to you, as I've said before? Then, Invite a Jewish friend to your church or to your Messianic to a Messianic congregation. Don't be afraid to invite them into your worshiping community. It may be that your Jewish friend might find it very uncomfortable. I know that I did when I first went to a church. Uh, and uh, you may find it helpful to invite them to our Messianic congregation or a Messianic congregation, depending where you live, uh, that they can see that other Jews believe in Jesus and follow him and worship him in a way that's culturally sensitive and uh, something that is known that they can feel at home and comfortable with. Uh, then, of course, uh, let me encourage you to use our resources on the internet, uh, many wonderful resources and web pages, testimonies and materials that you can use to share the gospel with your Jewish friends. Let me finish off this uh, message today with this passage from Romans 11, verses 12 and verse 15. If their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? And furthermore, verse 15, if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? You can imagine how these two verses really encourage us to realize that when Israel comes to faith in the Messiah, once again, it will mean great blessing for the world. It'll be riches for the Gentiles, Paul says, and it'll be like the life from the dead for the world. So when we are doing ministry to Jewish people, when we are uh, doing Jewish evangelism, we are not just working towards the blessing and salvation of Israel. We are actually working towards the blessing and salvation of the whole world. So let me encourage you with that. Think about these things from the Apostle Paul's writings. And uh, finally, let me tell you that Jewish evangelism is a ministry of destiny. God has destined us to succeed. Not us personally, or not our ministry personally, but generally the idea that one day Israel will be saved. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited, speaking to the Gentiles. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He'll banish uh, godliness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. There will come a day when, it, when God will reveal himself to all Israel. That is uh, not necessarily every individual, but all 
uh, Israel as a majority of the nation of Israel, those who open their hearts to the Messiah, who will come to faith in, in him. And this is something we're working towards, that there will be a day when God reveals himself. Open up the hearts of the nation of Israel to the Messiah and uh, bring them to faith, bring them to salvation. This is a wonderful uh, blessing that we are working towards. And uh, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you over these last two, two uh, Sundays uh, about bringing the gospel to Jewish people. Perhaps someday we can have time to do this more over a longer period of time. Thank you so much uh, to John Sutherland for inviting me, for the elders, and for this community at Manish uh, Church of Christ uh, for your partnership in the gospel. And may the Lord bless your testimony in your area, and may you provoke many people to jealousy, not only the Jewish people, but many people. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Let me pray. Well, thank you so much for uh, being able to share the practical advice on how to share the gospel with Jewish people, but also these scriptures. And I pray that you'll teach us by your Holy Spirit, lead us into wonderful conversations. May you use many people at Monash City Church of Christ to share the gospel with my people, the Jewish people, and that many will come to know that Jesus is the Messiah. For your glory, and as we raise Yeshua high for the whole world to see, may you bless this endeavor, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Let's talk to God together. Let's pray. to me. As we look around at the wonder of your creation, we can't help but praise and thank you and worship you.